Hot class, the earliest Chinese dynasties that we talked about was the Shia. This time we're going to talk about the Shang state or the Shang dynasty and for just a few minutes. And then next time we'll talk about the Zhou dynasty. The rise and success of the Shang Dynasty depended on several elements coming together, and they established these foundation stories to establish a unified Chinese society. So remember, we've studied creation stories. China does not necessarily have a creator deity or a creator story. They refer to basic elements as a life force, more of a cosmic creation. And the Shang state is going to develop a series of stories about sage kings who are heroic figures and who invented things like agriculture and domesticated animals. And they teach people how to live, how to make music, and things that are important to society. They were Chinese moralists who promoted values of social harmony and selfless dedication to others. Now, all of these stories are collected in the bamboo annals. This is a very important ancient text that has survived, holding the earliest legends of China's history. Today, a great deal of work, of that work inside the, the bamboo annal, annals has been found to be true. But in years past, scholars studied it as simply being a myth or a legend, but archeological evidence is proving a lot of this to be true that's in those annals. The original bamboo annal was lost, but surviving copies are still studied today. Now Tang, the first ruler of the Shang Dynasty, ruled justly and morally and unified the people. And he saw that the Shia kings had mistreated people and he used this to solidify his rule, sort of an early mandate of heaven. And what is mandate of heaven? It simply means that the ruler has been chosen as a bridge between earth and heaven to maintain balance and harmony. The mandate of heaven is an ancient Chinese belief and philosophical idea that heaven grants emperors the right to rule based on their ability to govern well and fairly. According to this belief, heaven bestows its mandate to the son of heaven and will withdraw it from a despotic ruler. The mandate of heaven class transfers to those who would rule best. So this concept is going to be used very early in this Shang state but it's later going to be used to support the rule of the kings of the Zhou dynasty. Tang came in and lowered taxes or tributes, and once during his reign, he issued gold coins to be paid to his citizens so they could buy back their children they had sold during a drought to survive. Sort of a stimulus package. According to the legend, Tang will sacrifice himself to end a national drought. So the rise and success of the Shang state depends on several things, and one of the more important elements of their rule proves to be an early monopoly that they established on access to copper and tin. They employed government craftsmen to turn out large quantities of weapons for rulers and armies, and they decided who obtained the weapons. They also employed scribes to write an official Shang propaganda history. And to control neighboring regions, they will use intermarriage to reinforce their rule as well as enforced tributes. They will also adopt horse domestication, developing into a chariot society, and the Shang will develop a er very early silk cultivation. The Shang state promoted agricultural development and they advanced metallurgy by using cast molding procedures that permitted huge increases of production. However, the demand for raw materials is going to require the need for many to work as lowly tribute laborers in the mines. <clears throat> this type of forced labor will ultimately bring the downfall to the Shang Dynasty. The Chinese official religion will be ancestor worship. The king will serve at the head, and they believed deceased family members are certain to exist and could influence the fortune of their lives. They could communicate with the ancestors by performing divination on oracle bones using a turtle or ox bone. A question would be carved into it using a heated pen. Cracks would appear and they would study the cracks for clues or answers. Oracle bones are the primary evidence of development of writing in China. Um, I thought this was interesting. This is an example of, of what was found on one oracle bone. Father Yi is harming the king. Father Dink 
is harming the king. It is not Father Dink who is harming the king. It is not Father Yi who is harming him. There is a sick tooth. So the poor king just had a toothache. Class, for years and years, oracle bones would be unearthed by farmers in China, and the farmers would call them dragon bones, and they would ground them up and create a tonic to drink. There's a map of the Shang spread. Now, China very early develops into a patrilineal society. Male elders are on top, and women were considered inferior. Women generally did not have much respect during this time. Women were important for one thing, and that was childbearing, and sons were given importance. Newborn daughters were often abandoned or sold into slavery. Marriages were arranged, and very little education would be offered to women as well. Death rituals reflected social hierarchy or social classes. There's a lot of evidence class of human sacrifices to accompany royalty to the afterlife. Women's slaves and servants were often put to death when a ruler died to be buried with him. Shang rulers were deified at death and became gods. There's one exception to the rule of how women were treated, <clears throat> and one of the early important women of the Shang state was Fu Hao. She was the wife of King Wu Di of Shang and is thought to have led several military campaigns. The reason we know so much about her is because they uncovered her incredible tomb in 17, 1976. Her tomb was lavish, filled with bronze, pottery, jade, cowrie shells, and it was filled <clears throat> with sacrificial victims as well as dogs and horses. According to one account within her tomb, there was 468 bronze objects, mirrors, knives, bells, weapons, 755 jade objects, arrowheads, 500 bone hairpins, and 7,000 pieces of cowrie shells. And I want to talk a second about silk fabric. Now, this is first developed in ancient China with some of the earliest examples of silk found from about 3500 BCE. Silk was originally reserved for the kings of China for their own use and gifts maybe to others, but it spread gradually through Chinese culture and trade, both geographic and socially, and then onto many regions of Asia. Silk rapidly becomes a popular luxury fabric in many areas accessible to Chinese merchants because of its wonderful textures and colors and luxury. Silk will be in great demand and becomes a staple of Eurasian trade. And there's evidence of silk trade that's found its way very, very early into Egypt, the Middle East, Mesopotamia, Europe, North Africa. The trade is so extensive over time that a major set of trade routes between Europe and Asia will come to be known as the Silk Road. The emperors of China strove to keep knowledge of silk making a secret to maintain the Chinese monopoly. Nonetheless, by around 100 of the Common Era, the practice had been established of making silk in India. So I want to move a little bit further out, class, and, and wrap up with a couple of uh, micro-societies. Um, let's talk a little bit about the South Pacific. I think this is interesting that, that starting in the fourth millennium BCE and, and accelerating up to 2500, there were migration waves out of China, out of places like Taiwan, Japan, and they set off by sea for Polynesian and, and uh, South Pacific islands. In large, fast, sophisticated sea craft, these Austronesian peoples expanded into the Pacific Islands. They had double outrigger canoes, and they were up to 100 feet long with huge triangular sails. And by 2500 BCE, they even used these stabilizing, de stabilizing devices that enabled even greater and longer voyages. But by 400 BCE, almost all of the islands of the South Pacific had been reached. Their expertise in sailing allowed Austronesians to dominate among these islands. And by 2000 BCE um, alone, these migrants had honestly, they had replaced all of the earlier peoples who had been there since about 28,000 BCE, known as Negritos. Over time, these migrants came to be known as Polynesians belonging to many islands. 
They shared common culture, common food items, and almost every settlement had these big ceremonial buildings and stone structures to promote unity and honor the ancestors. Now, one of the South Pacific Islands is Easter Island, and the Rapa Nui people lived on one of the most remote areas of the world. Class, Easter Island is really famous for their monumental statues. It's just amazing what they did. By the time of the European invasion in 1722, unfortunately, the Polynesian population had dropped to less than 3,000 people of the Rapa Nui's from 15,000 a century earlier, but some scholars believe that was due to overpopulation um, and then later the disease carried by the Europeans and slavery is going to reduce the Rapa Nui down to 111 on a census in 1877. Today, 5,800 people live there and 60% are descendants of the original Rapa Nui. But these are pretty incredible I think. And again, another um, area that we haven't talked about that I'd like to talk about is going to be early micro societies in the Americas. And in these early micro societies in the Americas, they have a lack of domesticated animals. They, have a, they don't have the wheel. And different things like that is really going to limit them. Um, their hunting and gathering skills are still going to be the main life way, and there's going to be some trading, and it will grow over time, but not as integrated as the territorial sites in Eurasia that we've talked about. South America had things a little bit better than, let's say, North America. They did have llamas and alpacas and also guinea pigs as domesticated animal for food. The Nordo Chico Society class lived in ancient Peru in the Andes mountain range, and they're thought to be some of the oldest civilization in the Americas. We know a lot about them because of the Espero site, this archeological site, and it reveals a local community um, that had a chieftaincy and the development over time of a complex society. They found massive stone tablets that had stories of a warrior class and their battles and prisoners and executions. And the Nordo Chico Society will later be replaced by the Chauvin Society. <clears throat> by 1400 BCE, the Chauvin peoples increased their population by supporting themselves with maize and other crops like quinoa and they also began to develop some long-distance trade, mainly over obsidian. Those made incredible arrowheads. The other early civilization in Mesoamerica that I want to mention are the Olmecs, and they were known as the rubber people. We don't really know the true name of the society, but rubber trees were prolific in the area. And they were defined by their ceremonial centers, like other groups we've talked about, and they also constructed drainage systems for uh, diverting water that remains visible and usable today. The incredible colossal heads is one of the most unique aspects of this culture. Um, made out of basalt rock, some were 10 feet tall and weighed 20 tons. They didn't really have a beast of burden and they needed thousands of workers or more to make one head. And they moved it by dragging or floating it on rafts and rolling it on logs. Now this is a very unique society known for use of an early ball game, but class ball games who the Mayans will perfect during this time <clears throat> are gonna be held using a very hard rubber ball and often were played to the death, kind of like Alabama and Auburn football. And if you want to see the ball game, there is a scene in a movie called The Road to El Dorado. You might be familiar with that. The Olmecs had barkless dogs. The elite wore gauged earrings. And one of their main deities was the were jaguar. The jaguar culture has a long history in Mesoamerica with the shaman at the head of the religion. And they had a creation story that centered around the tree of life. Class, does anyone know what this is on the slide? It's a bufo frog, and Olmec shamans were buried with the bufo frogs. The bufo frog produces a poison that can create a psychotic episode, and if you lick the toad, you would have a hallucinogenic experience. Class, do not try this at home. A bufo frog can kill small animals very easily. And finally, we've talked about life on the margins of Eurasia, life in Europe, the western frontier, sort of a wild, wild west. But I want to leave you with one more layer 
of their society at this time. They continue to battle over territory, resources, and warfare leads to the need for better weapons. They were still divided into self-sufficient communities, not a large hierarchical society. Warfare made them more innovative and it fueled demand for weapons and alcohol and horses and even women. An aggressive culture is taking shape here, class. They are favor their favored choice of alcoholic beverage was mead, and this is a beer made from honey. They have no centralized government and no centralized religion. However, they did develop some relig uh, rituals that were very important to their society. Male smoking and drinking rituals will develop. Men gathering together for a banquet and a night of festival drinking and bonding. Sort of what you used to do on Saturday nights before the pandemic, right? Blood brothers also become very important ritual. Uh, men not related by birth would swear allegiance to another by taking a blood oath and each participant would cut their palm and press them together and this was very serious to them. The history of smoking dates back as early as 5000 BCE in shamanistic rituals. Many ancient civilizations like the Babylonians, Indians, and Chinese burned incense as part of religious rituals as did the Israelites and later Christians. The smoking of tobacco was, as well as various hallucinogenic drugs, <clears throat> were used to achieve trances um, and to come into contact with the spirit world by many religions. I thought you'd be interested to know cannabis smoking was common in the Middle East before the arrival of tobacco from the Americas. According to the Greek historian Heter uh, Herodotus, around 500 BCE, he wrote this about the Scythians. The Scythians were a nomadic group in Iran, <clears throat> and he said this about them. The Scythians take some of the hemp seed creeping under the felt covers, throw it upon the red hot stones, and immediately it smokes and gives out such a vapor that the, that the Scythians delighted shout for joy. As usual, class, keep in touch.